Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Omega Vector Insight. We are continuing on with our subject of the core values that we discuss in Omega Vector. Last week, we discussed love, and this week, we're discussing the number two value. The number two value is trust. Trust is the second thing that we discuss on um, the types of values that we have. I really apologize. I just realized I don't have my headsets on and I don't know where they are. So I will talk a little louder. <laughs> um, with trust, we learned how to trust. Well, I mean, nobody really taught us how to trust. We learned how to mistrust. When it comes to trust, it's an innate core value. That's why we call these the core values. Love and trust, these are things that we just innately had. As a child, we trust anybody and everybody. Unfortunately, that is why it's easy to abduct children because they're so easily trusting. We, we trust until we learn not to trust. Now, the thing about the value of trust, it's harder to reestablish trust once trust has been broken. With love, we can have some heartbreaks and we're able to reestablish our love. But when it comes to trust, it's a little bit harder. Uh, it somehow it affects us deeper. Um, I don't know the exact terminology or the physiology, psychology of the idea of why trust injures us, mistrust injures us to a deeper level. I think it's probably because we're connected to emotions, our emotions, and it's shocking. We have this shock like, what happened? Um, there's many ways of breaking our trust. It goes anywhere from lying, when you discover somebody's lying to you or about you, gossiping, um, perhaps you were thrown under the bus, somebody just blamed you for something and you had no idea what was going on, or a breach of confidentiality, that can cause some mistrust, uh, taking advantage of, of someone, if somebody's taking advantage of you, that causes mistrust, uh, stealing, infidelity, uh, even a misdiagnosis from a doctor can cause us not to trust doctors or somebody doesn't do our taxes right and we don't trust our tax accountant anymore. Um, there's many ex examples of, of what causes us not to trust. Now, trust is tied to love, especially if it's in a personal relationship. It's hard for us to love somebody that we don't trust. If we're in an immediate relationship with them, it's really hard for us to love somebody if we don't trust them. Therefore, it's appropriate for us to build our trust back. Now, a lot of times people say, well, in order to have my trust, you have to earn it. I've heard that before. And the thing is, if somebody mistrust is if somebody causes us pain because they've broken our trust there is an aspect of us that says well you have to prove that i can trust you again but then we also have to be trusting again we can't sit on the sidelines and say go ahead and prove your trust to me before i trust you it's a two-way street so if somebody has a breach of confidentiality with me and i say to them okay I'll go ahead and attempt to do this again, then I must be able to trust them again. Now, I may be a little leery. I might test the waters and maybe give them something that I'm not too worried about if somebody else knows. Like there's still an element of mistrust in there. I'm really trying to do as the best way I can because trust is such a delicate topic. It really is. So one thing that we can do when it comes to trusting is we have to remember to connect the heart with the head because our head is going to say, don't trust this person. But sometimes our heart says, but wait, they're really apologetic. They really didn't mean it. And maybe it was something that slipped and they didn't realize they were breaching a confidentiality. Perhaps they thought somebody else knew, a third party knew, and they just talked freely and discovered, oops. And if they came to us saying, I really apologize, I think I did something. So there's a little bit of... Um, leeway when it comes to trust. If someone comes to me and apologizes because they've breached confidentiality, I'm more likely to trust them than if I discover it on my own. Again, I think the shock factor comes into play here. So again, it means I have to connect my head and my heart. 
My heart is the one that has the intuition. And I'm certain most of you know this. You have an intuition on whether or not you can trust a certain individual. There are some people that we align with and some people, uh, we kind of go, uh, not really sure this is somebody I would like to trust in my life. So trusting our intuition and then logic. We have to use our head, be safe. You know, when you go to a defense class, <laughs> they say, you know, keep, keep your surroundings, self-defense. Be aware of your surroundings at all times. Have the keys in your hands when you're walking to your car. Not that you're expecting it to happen, but be prepared. Now, unfortunately, that's the way society has become. When I grew up, we never locked the door. Half the time, the door would be open all night. You just, I mean, the screen door would be on, but you didn't even lock that. It, it would be open all night. There wasn't a reason not to trust. I mean, back in my day and age, we had a lot more trusting and unfortunately, or fortunately, less abductions. Kids walk to school. I walked to school for two miles. No, nobody said anything. It was like the, you just did. But today we'd be very leery about letting our children walking for two miles. So again, use your head and your heart. Now, just like love had levels of tr of love, trust has levels of trust. Of course, the highest level of trust is unconditional trust. You want to call it blind faith? Doesn't matter. Whatever you want to use. But this typically happens in close relationships. We love and trust our partners unconditionally until they do something that causes us not to trust them. But we typically go into the relationship with an unconditional trust for this individual. We typically have unconditional trust for our children. And this one kind of gets taken advantage of a little bit because sometimes our kids do take advantage of us, but we keep trusting them. I can't tell you how many times I know the kids are lying. You take a deep breath, you call them on it, and do I expect them not to lie anymore? No, because <laughs> they're kids. <laughs> we understand that. It goes with the territory. But that's part of unconditional trust. We expect it. We have um, unconditional trust with our parents. Uh, so as I said, it's close relationships. We have unconditional trust with our best friends. Uh, our, our core, our tribe. We have unconditional trust with those individuals as well. Then there's a level of trust, which is like an expectation of trust. It's expected that we both trust each other with strangers. For example, drivers on the road. We expect that the trust, they're gonna trust the drivers to drive as well as we're driving, all of you good drivers. <laughs> to pay attention to where you're driving. So we expect you'll follow the rules, the rules on the road. That's an expectation of trust. We have an expectation of trust when we go into the grocery store. We have an expectation of trust that the food provided for us is actually healthy when we purchase it. There's an expectation of trust with our coworkers. We have an, a level of trust that we expect. It's never spoken, but it's just an expectation, you know, work environment, and you expect the workers to work together. You expect your team members to be on the team. So again, that's another level of trust. It's the expectation of trust. Then there's the conditional trust, which sounds awkward to say, but it's true, we have a level of conditional trust. This mostly shows up in contracts. For those of you who have ever purchased a house or bought a vehicle, a timeshare, some large uh, purchase, there are layers and layers of paperwork that you literally are signing your name and signing your life away, but you have the expectation that that contract will be upheld. That's the uh, conditional trust. I will do this if this happens. I will do this if this happens. And then, of course, naturally, if there's a breach of trust, then there's negotiations and there's consequences for it. Of course, there's always consequences for an a, breach, a, a breach of trust. But again, the idea is that there is a conditional type of trust. Now, for those of us who've experienced trauma, and drama in our lives, which is pretty much everybody, it's hard for us to overcome that trauma and drama and retrust again. Uh, this is where risks come into play. Uh, you know, everything from, for those of you who know me, the fear of being attacked by birds because I was attacked by a bird and having to confront my fear and overcome it 
because it really became an illogical fear that I had to overcome. Now that's an easy one, but you know, for people who experience rape or embezzlement or um, are in jail and in, in, in falsely imprisoned, that's harder for us to bring that trust back up again. It requires a little bit of work and that's why we call it the work. I also want to mention one more thing before I skedaddle. Trust the obvious. If you're walking in a dark alley and there's a, I don't know if there's dark alleys anymore, but if you're walking in a dark alley and there is a stranger stalking about, trust that this individual does not mean you, I mean, means to do harm. Trust that. That's an obvious trust. If somebody breaks into your house, trust that they are there to steal. <laughs> so there's the obvious trust, which can be a negative. You can trust your intuition that says this person is not trustworthy. Trust your intuition that says this person is means me harm. Um, many times when you're in a situation, we panic and we don't trust the intuition we, we try to rationalize it. Oh, no, I'll be safe. And, you know, the I'm not saying don't have faith in humanity, but trust the obvious is the best idea that I can say. And the last thing I want to say about this when it comes to trust is we must remove our emotions. When it comes to rebuilding our trust, we must remove our emotions. Because there are people who, when the trust is broken, it lodges in the back of their mind. And even though they say, okay, I'll, I'll trust you again, it's still back there. And every once in a while, it'll come up and that thing will go, I knew I shouldn't have trusted them. Arr. And you bring it forward. So if you're going to reestablish trust, you've got to let that go. Now, I'm not saying forget about it. Obviously, it happened. You can't erase your memories, but don't throw emotion onto it. When we feed it with emotion, it gets bigger, like a balloon. It, gets, it expands and gets bigger than what it really was. Therefore, when we go to trust an individual, again, remember, we must include our head with our heart. Is it logical? Does this make sense to do that? And what does my heart say? Is this somebody I really can trust? Now, last week when I talked about love the unlovable, give to the undeserving, and forgive the unforgivable, there's really not a formula like that for trusting an individual. You know the parable or the phrase that's out there, um, fool me once, shame on me. Uh, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. That's the idea of, you know, being aware of the situation. If somebody's going to take advantage of you and you keep letting them take advantage of you, that's not, and still getting hurt about it, that's not trusting. That's, that's, I'm sorry, that's trusting, but that's not a, a way for you to blame them for the trust. You're the one who did it. You keep letting them take advantage. There's nobody to complain about. So either hush up or stop trusting them. Now, the ultimate question I have been asked is, can we trust everyone all the time? So the answer I'm going to give you may surprise you. Yes. <laughs> what I said before is trust the person will be who they are. So yes, I can trust everyone to be who they are. I can trust a liar to be a liar. I can trust an embezzler to embezzle. I can trust somebody who frequently gets involved in infidelity to frequently get involved in infidelity. It doesn't breach my level of trust. It actually gives me an awareness. Now, when I trust a liar to be a liar and I interact with them, I remember that they're a liar. So therefore, I don't put much weight in what they say. I still can listen. I still can be aware of what they're saying and acknowledge them and even find value in them, but don't take to heart what they're saying because I'm trusting that I know that they lie. Now, if there's a person who has a... Um, epiphany or life-changing event and they all of a sudden don't lie anymore well 
then I can trust that they've grown and okay, I can trust them even more. Like you, you can move your levels of trust along the way uh, according to each individual, just like love. Um, one of the phrases we use in Omega is I can love a rattlesnake, I don't need to live with it. Same thing, I could trust a rattlesnake, I could trust a rattlesnake is gonna be a rattlesnake, therefore I trust my interactions with the rattlesnake. I don't have to make this rattlesnake wrong for being a rattlesnake. And that's the key here. It is imperative if we want to continue with the value of trust, not to make others wrong for being untrustworthy or breaching our trust. They're just being who they are. And it is up to me to reestablish that level of trust within myself. You'll have to ask yourself the question, do I want to live my life not trusting people or trusting people? Do I want to live my life trusting or not trusting? The question really is up to you, and it's the level of trust that you want to have. It's entirely up to you as well. No right or wrong here. I just wanted to introduce the second value, which was trust. So, so far we've discussed love and trust. Next week, we will discuss the third type of core value that we have in Omega. So I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you for joining me this evening. I trust you have a beautiful evening. Bye now.